Hello folks, I hope you're having a great day today. Hey, today I want to take a look at Clark Ashton Smith's short story, The Seed from the Sepulcher. Um, it's written um, in 1933, published in Weird Tales. Um, and I will take a look at it. I found it in this collection. I just came across it today. It's actually not a collection of horror stories or anything like that. It's actually just a book of various pulp stories and various uh, genres in, in the pulp era um, that I was reading. Uh, it has everything in it from Western, some other things. Um, and I came across this short story it's an eight page, it's eight pages in this oversized collection, um, uh, and again, it was published in Weird Tales. It's a horror short story, although it has some science fiction elements to it, so it could be considered more science fiction than horror, although not really. I think it's definitely in the horror camp. Horror is an interesting genre, of course, because it typically will combine with something else, like horror fantasy, if it's got like vampires and magic or, you know, horror or whatever. So horror, in this case, it's combined with science fiction, uh, but it's still, it has all, it's the accoutrements, it's of, of being a horror story, not really a science fiction story. Uh, but anyway, what's, what, what, we'll take a look at this uh, synopsis here in a little minute for you. Um, I haven't done a Clark Ashton Smith story for you in a while. Um, I did a bunch of them for you for my Weird Tales 2 thing. Uh, I thought I would do this one for you too. I was totally surprised when I came across it. It's not in one of my Clark Ashton Smith collections and such. But basically what I'll do is go ahead and get started with a quick little synopsis and then why this particular story struck me so well. Um, I'm not going to give you every single Clark Ashton Smith story out there. I have There's many that I've read and enjoyed that I've not given for you. But this one struck me. It's different um, and, and I'll talk to you about why and why I kind of like it a lot um, after having reread it. But we'll set that, set that aside. So let's take a look, kind of a quick synopsis of the story. Again, it was eight pages long in this collection. Not very long at all. We're going to be opening it up in Venezuela. Uh, we have two people that are on a tour trying to find some uh, orchids that are rare so they could take back with them um, and sell them. Um, they're in a particular area of the, um, uh, of the Amazon in Venezuela that has uh, one of the dark, uh, a strong, down the river Orinco, which is one of the tributaries of it. It has one of the um, um, strong areas that you can find rare orchids and they're on one of the subsidiaries of the Orinco. Uh, what the, that they saw, um, there's two natives with them too that are kind of showing them around. They have two canoes uh, with, the, with the two locals and, and themselves. Uh, so there's four people total on the expedition that are helping find each other. Um, they had heard from some of the local natives that there is this nearby ruins that has that is rumored to have some, um, some untouched burial grounds and some untouched things in it that might be available for taking and bringing them back which would be a nice addition to their orchids. Um, so they decided to set out and check it out. It's a few days to journey from the main river. Um, we're opening up um, after one of the main characters has returned from that journey. And uh, he's talking to his, to his other guy. Now the other one wasn't able to go with him because he got to caught some, caught some sickness, which is very common for, for people that were, you know, obviously exploring uh, and adventuring during this time. So, you know, I, you know, <laughs> obviously if you're working out this, this way, you know, even though you're dealing with a lot of the, you might, you might start to become accustomed to the, the heat, uh, the, the tropical, you know, stuff, you're still going to get hit with, with, you know, virulent diseases, sicknesses, fevers, and this guy, and one of the two characters has been down with some fevers for about a week now on and off. And the guy who comes back is coming back, he didn't find anything, and he's coming back very discontent. Um, and our main point of view character, the one who was out sick, is thinking that's just not like him. He's kind of this more kind of positive, uh, ebullient kind of guy. Even if he was down because he wasn't able to find the treasure, he wouldn't just be down and disappointed and depressed. Like, he'd be like, let's go back again. Or, yeah, we got plenty of workers, we'll be fine. Um, but he shuts down any line of communication and investigation as to what he found, what was there, what he saw. Um, he's just not going to talk about it at all. He just seems very despondent um, and distressed um, in a very unusual way. What we're going to so they begin to set out. He's he's like done with his journey. Um, they want to head back out from this section and head back and go to the uh, nearby uh, fort to try to try to move move some of their stuff. Um, and head back out uh, on their expedition. Um, so they head back out to return. Um, on the return trip, he will get um, progressively worse on the next day. Um, and on the next day, he will wake up with some fevers and some, some stuff happening. Um, there does appear to be some sort of a sickness with his face. Um, there are some lesions on his face uh, and that sort of thing that seem to be uh, pretty serious and they're not anything that our main character, who knows some of the local, um, he's, he has a first aid kit, he knows some of the local diseases um, and does, doesn't isn't familiar with this specific one, although that's not that uncommon during this time. 
you know, you know, in the in the nineteen in, in the early nineteen hundreds, that wouldn't be too uncommon to encounter a disease that you were not familiar with, even if you had done some research on them or been in that area for a while. But anyway, um, they continue on their journey. Um, he, he, he doesn't know what it is, but he um, injects the, the guy with some morphine, uh, which seems to stabilize him. And um, after he's stabilized, he will tell the story of what happened and what he saw and why he ran away so frightfully. After he tells that story, then the rest of, the, of, of it will pick up. What I want to do actually for you is kind of show you that, that story. I actually have it right here. I'm actually going to read for you a couple of pages because I do like it like a whole lot lot. <laughs> uh, and so forth. He's talking about climbing down. He had arrived at these ruins. He had climbed down like a monkey, um, and so forth. And I kind of this is kind of Clark Ashton Smith. So if you're not familiar with it, I kind of want to give you just maybe a paragraph or two, so you can kind of get a feel for it. But here you go. It wasn't until I had thought he would, he'd, he'd climbed down. He had landed on some stuff and was looking around. Um, it wasn't until I thought of climbing out that I noticed the real horror. In one of the corners, the corner nearest to the opening in the roof. I looked up and saw in the webby shadows. Uh, ten feet above hung my head, and it hung. I almost untouched it, unknowing when I descended the rope. It looked like a sort of white lattice work at first. Then I saw that the lattice was partly formed of human bones, a complete skeleton, very tall and stalwart, like that of a warrior. A pale, withered thing grew out of the skull like a set of fantastic antlers, ending in myriads of long and stringy tendrils that spread upward until they reached the roof. They must have lifted the skeleton or body along with them as they climbed. I examined the thing with my flashlight. It must have been a plant of some sort, and apparently it had grown in the cranium. Some of the branches had issued from the Croven Clown across the eye holes, the mouth, and the nose holes to flare upward, and the roots of the blasphemous thing had gone downward, trellising themselves on every bone. The very toes and fingers were ringed with them, and they drooped in writhing coils. So that gives you an idea kind of what Clark has to his writing style. He's very florid. Um, he can be a little purple sometimes. He'll have sometimes like, the occasional extra adjective that he needs. <laughs> but that's also very common um, and very good in the pulp era. And it's considered actually a good thing during that. But you get an idea of where they're at. They're in this um, uh, the, the sepulcher of this these ruins in, in the burial areas where a lot of the people uh, were laid to rest. He's exploring it, obviously, for treasure. Um, and comes across this skull and with this odd scent of... of plant-like um, antlerish things that grow from the thing things and seem to sprout from the cranium of this skull a long time ago anyway um so that's what's happening that's what he's going to find that's what he's going to confess to and then after he does that um about that's about 40 percent of the way to do the story um, and then the rest of the story will pick up from there now i'm just going to leave you to it so you can check it out on below i'll link you to it there's it's free on the line because the copyright on this has lapsed um so i'll link you to the free version in case you want to check it out as well as to i'll, I'll try to find a collection that isn't the big book of adventure stories because this thing's like like hundreds and hundreds of pages long <laughs> you know and if unless you're interested in something like this and reading all the pulps and stuff like i am um then you're not gonna <laughs> you're probably not going to you know obviously want to uh probably buy something that's that big and hefty for your for your collections but uh i'll uh, but I'll, but I will, what I'll do is link it to it now i was surprised when i read the seed uh, from the sepulchre because i didn't i double checked to make sure that it wasn't in one of my clark ashton smith collections and i just missed it it wasn't which is a little sad. Um, I, in fact, I just read it today. I was I was finishing up a, um, a story in there by Saki, uh, the horror writer, and this was like the next story down. And I was like, I don't remember reading this. So let's go ahead and read it. Um, so I read it today. I figured it would be pretty fun to try to read a story. I, I do like some things about it. First of all, it's not set in one of Clark Ashton Smith's other worlds. Clark Ashton Smith was um, a world crafter. That's what he brought to his writing during this era. Um, this, you know, he was one of three in the big, big of uh, weird tales. H.P. Lovecraft was all about these big giant creatures. Uh, these giant, uh, uh, the, the world doesn't care about you. Nobody's out for you. Um, if you realized how bad and nasty this stuff was, um, you know, you would die of, you would go crazy from madness or die of it. Um, it's you know no, nobody's out to get you, and these 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 giant Cthulhu's. Um, so Lovecraft had his Cthulhu, um, and and Robert E. Howard, another one of the big writers for Weird Tales, had his big giant heroes like Conan, Solomon Cain, you know, Call the Conqueror. Um, he had these giant epic heroes that were very much kind of these you know great strong a aspects of the pulp era, right? So so whereas you know one of them had 
their heroes, and another one had their sort of you know, their sort of creatures, their odd and unusual sort of things that were happening. The third crafted worlds. Clark Ashton Smith would create different worlds, Xanthique, uh, Vienoir, and Hyperborea, and many more that were out there that he would craft as a part of his world building. Um, and these were typically fantasy worlds that might have some lower fantasy in them, some sword and sandal in some places, um, and then in some others, more traditional sort of fantasies. Um, my favorite is Xanthique, the stories that are set in kind of a dying earth world that's set far in the future, uh, where everybody's sort of dark and out to get each other. Magic has come back. In our, in our dying days, so there is magic, but it feels very not like your normal magic. Um, there's lots of undead, because there's lots of bodies by that time, you know, thousands of years in the future, so there's necromancers are very powerful. Um, there's a lot of great works in there. I've reviewed for you a lot of works from the Zothic series, because I like it, and I thought it'd be fun to kind of walk you through the series with a weekly review. So I, I have done that, I've done some other things too out there for you, but he was the world builder. But in none of the, the various, uh, sh whether it's the, uh, his collection from Penguin Classics or some of the other ones, have I, have I had the story? I went back and double checked just to make sure. I don't have it anyway. <laughs> which, which again was, what shocks me because of how different and good this story is. Um, when Clark Ashton Smith does, one of the things I like about the story, again, is that it's set kind of in the modern day. It's a good story, actually, I think, to get you started with Clark Ashton Smith because if you want to pick him up, you don't have to read one of it. It's not set in one of his worlds. You don't have to know his world. It's not. There's no magic in it. There's no wizards. There's no you know, uh, you know demons or anything else like that. Right? It's 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 a, it's a much more sort of a natural world setting. It, you know, this could happen to anybody. Now, obviously, nobody's in in Venezuela. You know, adventuring, you know, exploring, finding uh, you know wild and rare orchids to bring back home for 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 serious money. Right? Obviously, that that may not be the case. A hundred years later, we we all. We now know what the exterior of our world looks like, but still, there's this, you know, this, you know, you know, Venezuela, a hundred years ago, is a very realistic setting, right? Um, even though they find something that's not uh, natural, um, and they explain, he explains in, in a couple paragraphs later that it's actually from from science, from space. He believes he believes it's from space <coughs> that nothing on Earth could be like this. But anyway. There you are. Um, so I'll leave it to you. It's also a very body horror story thing with some plant life. Um, Clark Ashton Smith doesn't always do body horror. A lot of his, for example, most of his Zothique stories don't have any body horror in them at all as one of the sort of the key elements. Instead, they're more intellectual horror stories. And that's true from everything from the Seven, seven Geshes uh, to, um, you know, um, some of the, the Dark Idolin. You know his hyperborea stuff. His, you know, other things that I've read. Um, he typically is more of an intellectual horror. Um, he, his his horror is here, or or his horror is moral in nature. Um, but it's not. It's here. It's not a visceral body horror. And I think he does a great job in here. Um, so I think it mixes his up a lot. It's more body horror, which is not something I've typically read from him. It's set in the modern times. It's you know it's not set in one of his worlds. It doesn't have a whole bunch of fantasy. It's not a dark fantasy in any way, shape, or form which I like. It gives you a chance to see his writing style on review, and if you like it, then you can go and explore it. So I actually think this would probably be a good short story to start with if you've heard of Clark Ashton Smith, but you never got around to actually reading a Clark Ashton Smith story. This might be a pretty good one to start with and see if you like it. And then if you do, you can take, 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 uh, take, take a, a big deep dive down into the large amount of fiction he did. He only wrote fiction from about 29 to 36 or 37 um, about eight years in his school life, but he was publishing more than one story a, a month during that time period. He was publishing them a lot, um, and they all tend to be of pretty same quality. Um, for the first different, uh, he wrote for a number of stories, but he was really big uh, in weird tales. Um, but he wrote a lot of stories during that time period. So although it's just eight years, he wrote that, that was his major way of getting money to help himself, to help his family. Um, but then once his both of his parents had died in 36 and 37, and his two big friends in, um, in Robert E. Howard died, uh, committed suicide uh, at the age of 30 um, in 36, and Lovecraft died in 37. So uh, after that happened, he kind of lost the, uh, and, and he wasn't need, needing the money for his parents anymore because they had both passed away. He just wasn't no longer in that sort of a writing space. He kind of lost that muse. Um, and so, um, as a result, he, he wasn't writing as much. Um, I have done talk more about him in some of my previous reviews, so I won't spend too much time in his biography other than the fact that he was really more of a poet, um, a sculptor, he was more of an artist than he was a writer in that sort of traditional uh, um, fiction sense. Um, 
But feel free to take a look at him, do some Googling and so forth if you're, if you're interested in checking him out. Uh, but I'll go ahead and leave it to you there. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Did you agree or disagree with my thoughts? I'm happy to engage you on that um, and, and talk to you about that more. If the, you know, the second half of the story, there are some specific details you want to talk about um, that I didn't go into because I didn't want to be a spoiler. I'm also happy to do that. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Let's talk about why. I'm happy to engage you with that. And finally, hey, if you watched this video and you enjoyed it, please feel free to hit that subscribe button because, you know, we all uh, hopefully will have some different videos for you. I try to do three of them a week uh, of different reviews. Typically, our reviews of classics and fantasy, science fiction, and horror um, that you either never heard of um, or that we... Um, or that you have heard of, but you've never had a chance to actually go out because you're so busy with the newer stuff uh, and so forth. So that's the purpose of this channel. So hit the subscribe button. You're going to find a whole lot more to follow. And hey, I just want to thank you for taking some time out of your day and watching this video all the way to the end. We all have such busy days, such busy lives, and so many things happening. So the fact that you spent this time with me, that's very humbling, and I appreciate that. So thanks again, and have a good one.